Let's begin our week three lesson with prayer. Heavenly Father, we gather tonight to be about your word, and we pray that you would help us to become even more convinced, uh, if needs be, that your word is the truth, that the word of the Old Testament is fulfilled in Christ. Bless us as we study that our faith also grow, so that we also might become messengers of the, of the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Now today, uh, David, you weren't here when I said this, but lesson two um, is for your own personal study because we just went through verbal inspiration when we were in 2 Timothy chapter 3. So I didn't want to hammer it one more time. We're going to still get it in chapter 1. Now chapter 1 verses 4 to 14 to the end of the chapter is the first step of the writer to the Hebrews fulfilling his theme, which is Christ is greater than everything else. He's superior. So why, why Jewish Christians would you want to go back to Judaism? Christ is superior. Today, he's superior than the angels. Now, in Judaism at the time, angels were looked at a little bit differently than perhaps they should have been, almost like a cultic view of angels. So I wanted to start out today by talking about what is the world's view of angels today? What do you notice from things? How do they talk about angels? Yeah, Liz. Um, sometimes they talk that we will turn into angels. Boy, we see that all the time, people turning into angels. Um, impossible. That's just as impossible for a human to turn into an angel as it is for an ape to turn into a human. Different classes of creation. Angels were a creation, humans are a creation, the animal kingdom's a creation, and especially with, with animals, they don't have the right genetic structure, you know. They're one off. <laughs> okay? Can't happen. Any other thoughts that you see from from this world today, as a few angels. Are almost viewed as like a lucky rabbit's foot of like, oh, you got your guardian angel there. And yeah. Just, yeah. Know, whatever. Yeah, I think that the people look at, some people look at angels as kind of their lucky charm. Now, other ways to look at it. They're babies. They're depicted as babies in pictures. Yeah, a lot of times, aren't they? And I think that comes from the idea of what a cherub is. Must be some little fat little thing. Uh, not really what a cherub was. Others? Anybody else? It's one of the reasons I, I really don't like It's a Wonderful Life, that movie. Clarence, you know, had to do a good deed, so the bell rings and he gets his wings. Well, not all angels have wings. And many of them have six, not two. Never seen a six-winged angel on top of a Christmas tree, have you? But the misunderstanding about angels goes into all kinds of media things, too. The last class somebody brought up, yeah, Hallmark. <laughs> Talk about angels. I think they, today, angels are just lumped all together instead of realizing there's different categories or types of angels. I believe that's true. The world doesn't really get what an angel is. So in the Bible, and we're going to talk about that in just a second, there are different classes of angels that do different things. Anybody else? So Some people name her daughter's angels. Yeah, well, Angela. Right? Angela is just angel. I think in the Spanish culture, the even males, right? You can have an angel, uh, a name for males even. Yeah. Wouldn't have the A on the end. Anybody else? I think probably the biggest one, though, is when you die, you can become an angel. And I think that's the biggest one I've, I've heard today. Well, let's take a look at angels, uh, just generally speaking. Let's talk about that before we get into the text. Um, First of all, let's identify the angel of the Lord a second, because that's not a created angel. That's the Son of God, pre-incarnate Christ, and so you can't even say Jesus, because Jesus is the name given to the God-man Savior, 
after his incarnation. But it is the second person of the Trinity that shows up. Now, angels oftentimes showed up as looking like humans, right? You think of the three angels that visited Abraham, and two of them went on, the two created angels went on to Sodom to talk to Lot, and the Son of God, the angel of the Lord, stayed there with, with Abraham, and Abraham prayed to him, right, right, for Sodom, okay? Or Sunday, let's see, or Monday, oh yeah, we didn't do the reading Monday night, but it was in the bulletin. But on Sunday, the Old Testament reading was the burning bush episode, right? And there it says that Moses sees this burst brush it's burning but not being consumed that's because the angel of the Lord was in there and the glory of the Lord they're coupled together there and then when God speaks from the fire from that bush it says God says so we know the angel of the Lord the glory of the Lord is God okay that's a really important passage of the scriptures so let's talk about the word angel for a second though in the Old Testament the word is Malach. So angel of the Lord, Malach Adonai. Angel, Malach, is the same meaning as it is in the Greek, Angelus. Los Angelus is the city of the angels. That's how it got named, okay? They sure aren't angels now, I'll tell you that. But the word angel, its basic meaning is message, a message or a messenger. The word gospel could be translated to good angel, oi angelion. The basic thought of angel, the word, means message, and the person who carries a message is a messenger. And that then got associated with these created beings that are servants of God. And if you think about it, a lot of the angels, that's what they did. They brought messages. Let's say Gabriel brought messages to... Zechariah and Mary. The angels at Christmas brought a message to the shepherds. The angels at the resurrection of Jesus, what did they do? Another message. He's not here, he's risen, just like he said. The angels that show up at the ascension after Jesus ascends and the disciples are looking up. Why are you looking up into heaven? Another message. He's coming back. Now, normally, the good news, the message of, of Christ is entrusted to the people of the church. But in special cases, the Lord sent angels to talk to his people. And, of course, the greatest was the angel of the Lord, the Son of God himself, brought messages. In fact, he is the Word of God. All right? Y'all with me on that? The world doesn't get that part, okay? And I think the world also would look at angels more as guardian angels than they would look at all the other things the angels did. Now let's think about that. What are the things the angels have done? What do they do? That we know about. That we know about, yeah, from the scriptures. They protect us. Protect. What, is it? what is it, Psalm 90 or 91? You will give his angels charge over us to guide you in all your ways so you won't dash your foot against the stone. That wicked angel called the devil used that against Jesus to tempt him in one of the temptations, right? Jump off the temple pinnacle. Don't you trust the scriptures? And that was the temptation, okay? What else do, the, do angels do? They fight. They are fighters. They're warriors. Not all of them, but at least some are. Think of the angel that protected the Garden of Eden after Adam and Eve were expelled. That angel was a flaming sword. Okay. Or Jesus talks about that at his arrest. Now, next week, Wednesday, sermon, uh, we'll talk about that, one of the cross-examination questions. Uh, Peter, are you trying to stop me from getting my job done? Uh, put that sword back into the sheath. And Jesus then tells them, don't you realize that I could bring on 10 legions of angels to fight for me? And you know what? He didn't need angels. He could have gone like that. In fact, he proved it to those people that night. And they fell backwards. Yeah. Who, who, who are you looking for? 
Jesus of Nazareth. Well, I'm he. Bam, they went over backwards. And when people faint, they don't go over backwards. Did you know that? This wasn't just a fainting spell. This was a miracle of Jesus to show them, I'm going willingly, you can't take me. And then 10,000 angels, angels can't die. Well, that'd be an easy battle, right? 10 legions. All right, what else are angels? What else do we know they've done? They ministered to Jesus after he was tempted. They're ministering servants. Their job is to serve. Ministers serve, right? That's the word serve. And uh, they certainly served Jesus at that time uh, in Gethsemane. Also, after his temptation, the angels came to serve Jesus. Uh, and and uh, rightly so, because he was their God and king. They stand around the throne and praise him. Oh, yeah. Now we come to the cherubs. Uh, cherub, uh, they're the praisers, the praising angels. And the cherubs have two wings. We know that because the cherubs were placed, or replicas, on the top of the Ark of the Covenant with their wings touching. When Solomon built his uh, built the temple in Jerusalem, perfect cube, right? And he had the whole thing overlaid in gold. And then they went like this and pounded into the gold cherubim across the back, and they would touch, the wings would touch on all the walls. That must have been a sight. Of course, the picture of the most holy place, we'll get that a little later in Hebrews, is a picture of heaven. And so they made it as brilliant as they could. Second temple didn't have all that. Okay? So the cherubs, there's singers. What are, there's some other angels we know about. A cl another class of angels. Seraphim. The seraphs. Yeah, the seraphim. Now when you have an I am on the back of a word like cherubim and seraphim, uh, that, those are called duels in Hebrew. It's a kind of a weird kind of a plural that we don't really have in English and the West really doesn't have in language. But it, it's just, it's never singular. Cherubim is never singular. They're on the cherubim, <laughs> uh, they're collective. Same thing with the seraphs. Um, God's name, Elohim, has that same ending. So you have that plurality of persons right in the name God. Okay? Now in the Old Testament, they didn't have the a clear definition of the triune God, but like we do in the New Testament, but they understood the, the multiplicity of persons within the Trinity. So, seraphim, we hear about the seraphs in particular in Isaiah 6, and the call of Isaiah to serve as prophet, right? Those seraphim, those fiery ones, the word seraph is the Hebrew word for fire, the fiery ones, and they were up there in the throne room of God, trying to outshout each other. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. And then another group says, the whole earth is filled with his glory. Holy, 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 the whole and they're, and they're doing it so loud, back and forth, antiphonally, that the thresholds of heaven are shaking. Back to earthquake again, oh, it was heavenquake. And Isaiah's witnessing all this. He said, oh no, I'm gonna die because my eyes have seen uh, the Lord. The they had six wings. Yeah, the seraphs have six wings. Uh, with two, they covered their eyes. With two, they covered their feet. A statement of humility in the presence of the Almighty God. And with two, they were flying around. <laughs> uh, that must be some. I can't wait to meet some of those guys. Or actually, some of those it's, because they don't have gender angels. What were the ones that in Revelation that carried out uh, certain things that happened on earth. Um, like they had the, the basket and they were supposed to go and scatter it among the four winds or something like that. Now, in one place, the four winds are talked about as angels bringing from the four winds, the winds. Yeah. Uh, angels in Revelation, of course, are pictures. We have to be careful, like like the one in uh, Ezekiel, where you have, they look like gyroscopes, yeah. the, the angels. 
And of course, we have the same thing up in uh, Revelation, picking up on that a little bit. Uh, some of the angels are reapers. Jesus taught a parable that on the last day, the angels will reap, right? In Matthew 25. Um, and they carried Lazarus' soul to heaven. Yeah, and again, and again, that's a parable, so we have to be careful not to say that happens every time a believer dies, you know, he's being carried uh, by the angels. It may be that way, but Jesus was making a point. They have Moses and the prophets there. So we have uh, the angel of death and the Passover. Ah, who is the angel that brought death to the firstborn in Egypt? That would be the, the angel of the son. Lord. That's the angel of the Lord. That's the son of God doing <laughs> that. God. Yeah. Um, the Lord is the Lord of life and death after all. So there we have to be careful. It's not a created angel that, that carries out that. And of course, we're going to get to a passage after a while that says that this son of God is the son of righteousness and justice. Judgment day, that'll be happening too. Go ahead. Yeah, angels are in a great transport business. <laughs> great transport business? How so? The prophet that they carried away. Oh, Elijah, that's Elijah. true. Elijah was brought to heaven in a whirlwind. And um, I know that chariot, and the horsemen of Israel, those are angels. And exactly what that was is a mystery because only Elisha saw it. Um, but um, yeah, the chariot wasn't a literal chariot. If you look, probably the seraphim, you know, the fiery ones, went up in the fiery uh, thing with the horsemen of Israel. Elisha saw the horsemen of Israel too. Uh, when uh, when his, uh, what was the name of the, his... Uh, the Assyrian king. Yeah, no, what, what was the name of Gehazi? Yeah. Yeah, his servant kind of turned and, and uh, you know, Gehazi, this is before he did that, he said, look, we're in trouble because the army's out there. And he opened his eyes and he see all the horsemen of Israel. Those were the angels of God. Yeah, I think so. Those were the army. Now you got the fighters again, yeah. There's some cool stories in the Bible. I forgot about the Elijah to heaven thing, but yeah, that's why I said, you know, there it's also something, we can't make doctrinal points on that, that, you know, you could look at it different ways, I suppose, but certainly the angels are involved in the reaping process. And that might, it might be that every one of us, when we die, that the angels escort our souls to heaven. I, that's really possible, but I can't say that with certainty. I can't wait to see angels. Sometimes they're guardian angels too, and I, we should talk about that a second because people have the wrong idea of guardian angels in, in the sense that the Bible only talks about guardian angels in reference to watching over children. Their angels, Jesus says about watching over the children, do see the face, always do see the face of God. But it never says that about everybody, so I don't know if every one of us has a guardian angel. Uh, but angels protect all of us, okay? But it looks like children actually have that, uh, you know. So again, that's the only reference we have in the Bible to it, and so we have to be careful not to say too much or too little. Uh, but boy, sometimes don't you wonder if that wasn't an angel there protecting? Where is the reference for children? It's in the New Testament. Matthew. It's in Matthew, I think, yeah. I'm going to guess around 16 to 18, something like that. Okay, now Jesus talks about angels quite a bit, uh, or at least they show up quite a bit. Luke has them. But Matthew is an interesting one because of the view of angels in Judaism at the time. It wasn't necessarily accurate. Okay, so all of those things are there. Uh, all of the servants of God that are called angels, all of them are there to minister to God. They serve their creator either directly or by serving creatures and, you know, the, the universe as far as that goes. Um, they were created beings. Uh, do you know what day they were created? If you're going, no, then you're as smart as I am, because um, honestly, I don't know either. We don't know what day they were created, but we know they're created beings, 
So it had to happen between day one and day six. Right? I have a hunch that it may have been day five. And my hunch comes only from this point of view, and that's that in the Psalms, and it might be in Isaiah too, where they, the, the scriptures talk about angels as being like the stars of heaven. And we know on day four is when all of the sun, moon, and stars were created. That's the only thing I could say. I remember Professor Becker talking that way back in school days. And, uh, but he said what I'm going to say, too, is we just don't know. But they were all perfect yet on day seven because everything was perfect, right? So sometime the fall of the angels happened between day, end of day seven and the fall into sin. So when we think about those those guys, they were led by Satan to rebel against their creator. Satan wanted to replace God. And of course, every sin is about the same thing, isn't it? You think about it. Yeah. We don't know much about that. Uh, St. Peter in the second letter a little bit, Jude a little bit. And that's about it. Or Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Uh, there's not a lot of details about the fall, just that it is. Okay, just that it is, that it happened. Thoughts? Did you find a passage for yeah, Scott? Matthew, Matthew 18, 10. Uh, it's right in the Matthew 18. Okay. About, that's the ministry of the keys work in there, right? See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels <clears throat> in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. They are T-H-E-I-R, possessive. Thank you. That was good. So those angels that rebelled, they were, we call them demons, but they're angels. Uh, but they're fallen angels led by Satan, that dragon. And, um, you know, there's a, a particularly interesting section when we talk about angels in Revelation. And I remember in Revelation class, I don't know if some of you were in there, uh, we talked about this quite extensively in chapter 12 of uh, Revelation. And this is a great and wondrous sign prepared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. Kind of reminds you of Joseph's dream. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that's the reference here. She was pregnant. This is the church of the Old Testament, right? That's the picture that Joseph had. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon, that's Satan, okay, here, with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head. He wants to look like God. He wants to look like God. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. Satan attacking the church, right? The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth. That's usually where the midwife would stand. This is a gory picture if you think about it. So the woman's ready to give birth and the dragon's sitting there with his mouth open, ready to eat it and gobble it up. Because if they get the sun, then his head won't get crushed, right? so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to her son, a male child, who will rule all nations with an iron scepter. That's the Son of God, is it not? Mm -hmm. That's our Savior. And, 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 uh, and her child was snatched up to God and to his throne, the ascension. The woman fled to the desert, a place prepared for her by God, where she will be taken care of for the New Testament era, basically. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. And where do you hear that? Every other week. Yeah. It's part of the communion service. Isn't that cool? Yeah. So you have this battle going on, probably happening on Good Friday. 
but certainly a battle that was going on for a while while Christ was in the world and shortly thereafter. So the real question is, who's Michael? Here it surely appears that it's the Son of God, who's the head of all the angels, right? Michael is the Hebrew word that says who is like God or who is like God. If it's who is like God, it's the same way of saying he is God. If it's who is like God, he mirrors God. There are some passages like in Daniel where Michael shows up that Michael looks like a created angel. Uh, same thing in Jude. Here, though, it sure looks like the Son of God. So it's an open question, who is Michael? Okay. Now, Gabriel, that's a different story. Gabriel, the, 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 the Greek, uh, the Hebrew, Geber, yeah. The Hebrew word Geber means power, strength. And so in the power of God, E-L at the end of a name often means God. That's a short form for God. So God's, in the power of God or God's power, uh, that's Gabriel. We know he's a created angel. Uh, other than that, uh, we know the evil angel, Satan, and he has a couple other names in the Old Testament. Other than that, we don't have the names of angels, do we? The angel of the Lord, of course, the Son of God. But that's about it, unless you can think of another one. Of course, there are some slang names for him, too, you know, Beelzebul, <laughs> God of the Dung Heap. That's a good way to describe Satan. It could be even more vulgar, but I won't because it's going on TV. <laughs> All right. So there you have the background to, to angels. And my goodness, it'll be kind of cool to see them, won't it? When you think of the picture of heaven where Christ is on his throne in the center with God the Father. And, and you have the four living creatures around the throne. And you have the 24 elders around the throne. And, and, the, and, and you have all of the angels bringing praise to God, and all of the saints are going to be doing the same thing. That's going to be kind of cool. Talk about a neat worship service. <laughs> and we won't need the confession of sins and absolution anymore in heaven, right? Perfect people, perfected people like Christ. And uh, means no more sin, no more sorrow. Wow, what a neat thing we got to look forward to, huh? Might be kind of cool to be able to talk to Gabriel. I'm a, we got eternity. I'm going to get to everybody. You know, <laughs> I don't know what the Lord's going to have me doing in heaven, but I'll tell you what, I can't wait to get there. If you're the last person in, it's still great. <laughs> no buzzer beaters, though, I hope. I don't want to be a buzzer beater. Okay, ready to move on to the verses now? You kind of have to have that background going in. The writer to the Hebrews knew that the people he was writing to had a good background in what the angels were, okay? He knew that. And now he's going to come up with statement after statement. There's seven quotes from the Old Testament here, each one of them supporting the truth, Christ is superior to the angels, and here's why, okay? So verse 4, he became much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. What's the name he inherited? Now think about Jesus Christ in his humility. He's true God and true man, and he inherits a name. Son of God. Son of God. Yeah, even though he's son of man too, right? Now what's in the name? As you know, I say this all the time, a person's name is his or her reputation. So Christ's name is everything we know about him from the scriptures. And the biggest thing we know about him, outside of the fact he's true God and true man, is that he is the Redeemer, the Savior. He is the one who came and, and fulfilled all the promises of God that we might have forgiveness, life, and salvation. What's in the name? What a reputation our Savior has. So he was given a superior name. The name is his reputation. And the name given to Christ is Son. Now, his proper name is Jesus, right? The God-man's name is Jesus, uh, but he's also the Son of God. It was easy to see he was the Son of Man, right? They knew about Mary, his mother, and Joseph, and, and they knew about, at least the people of Nazareth, they knew he had brothers and sisters and stuff like that, right? He even died like a human. 
But it's true, God, he rose from the dead triumphant, huh? And the angels were there celebrating. Makes Easter kind of cool. Okay, now there's, I already said, there's seven Old Testament uh, quotations that support verse 4. He's superior to the angels. And the author's use of the Old Testament will clearly attest to this truth that the entire Old Testament is the voice of God himself. The voice of God is the Old Testament. And when God speaks, he fulfills. And that's why we see Jesus Christ. Okay? So Jesus is very God. And that is a really strong attestation to at least the writer to the Hebrews believed in verbal inspiration. Okay? So why go back to Judaism if Christ is the fulfillment of everything in the Old Testament? It doesn't make sense. And yeah, I know it's tough for you uh, Jewish people that are suffering right now, but guess what? Heaven is coming. Okay, who'd like to read verse 5a, just the first half? I've got them all printed in your, wor in your worship folder to you. Uh, uh, in, your, in your class notes there, 5a. Anybody? Go ahead, John. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son? Today I have become your father. Well, it's pretty obvious, right? He never said to any of the angels, you're, you're my son. Now, he does say to us who are believers in Jesus, you're my son. Or we would say today, my children. Because we are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. But angels never got that. Psalm 2, verse 7, a messianic psalm. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. So he's quoting Psalm 2. Psalm 2 is a messianic psalm, but it's been fought over for a while in, in uh, biblical, uh, you know, theological circles that maybe that's David talking about himself. And it's the case with many of the Old Testament prophecies about the Christ is that without the New Testament, you don't know the answer. Now we're back to that axiom, Scripture interprets Scripture. So if you just take passages like Psalm 2 or Psalm 8, um, and you'll see, uh, maybe I didn't give you that part, but in Psalm 8, uh, and the parallels here, it's been argued for a long time that this isn't talking about Christ. Psalm 2, 2, 2, 2. And, and uh, the fact of the matter it is because he says it is. So people that don't believe in verbal inspiration, you can see how they get all messed up with the scriptures. It's actually pretty simple, right? Okay. <clears throat> we know for certain Psalm 2 is a messianic promise, a messianic psalm, because Hebrew says so. And you, there's a lot of Bible passages, right, in the New Testament that convince us Christ is the fulfillment. In fact, the whole Gospel of Matthew is written to teach that point. Matthew written to Jewish Christians. 5B. Anybody? David? Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. Okay. This or again is a second passage that supports the same truth. This is the son. Now, do you remember the context of 2 Samuel 7? David has now become the king of peace. All the wars have ended. And David had finished building his, his palace just south of the current temple, day, uh, temple court today, the platform there, just south of there. And David now is going, I want to give praise to my God in a tangible way. I'm going to build the temple. And the Lord sent his prophet, David's pastor, to him and said, are you going to build a temple for my name? You're a man of blood. You can't do that. But I'll tell you what I'm going to do. This is my own words, but it's what the Lord is saying. You're not going to build a temple for my name. I'm going to build one for yours. I'm going to make your son great. And he'll roll, rule on your throne, Olam Olam, forever and ever. Now, if you didn't have Hebrews here, but this one's quoted in other places too. If you didn't have Hebrews, you wouldn't know that that was talking about the Son of God. You'd think it was just Solomon there. Remember when we talked about uh, Old Testament, we talked about double fulfilled promises, prophecies? 
That's one of them. Solomon, yes, was the first fulfillment of the promise, but because he kept that one, he'd keep the other one with the permanent king, Jesus Christ. So now you see the head of the church, Christ, and the Son of God is in that position. What angel did he ever say that to? Well, Satan wanted to have it. Okay. Chapter 7 is a big chapter uh, in 2 Samuel. It's one of the biggest passages in the Old Testament about Christ. Ranks right up there with Isaiah 53 and 54, 55, 56. And uh, some of those passages are really huge. Uh, the third promise here, the third quote, uh, verse 6. Anybody? Edie, thank you. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Now, this is interesting. Because if you read it out of any of the translations that we have today, you're going to re read, rejoice you nations with his people. How in the world could the writer to the Hebrews say it's angels and not nations? This is an interesting uh, phenomenon. If you read the Septuagint Greek, that's where the writer is quoting. He's quoting the Greek translation of the Old Testament Hebrew. Now, sometimes with copying, you end up with some problems, you know, misquotes. And all of our translations basically go back to the Masoretic text, which took about 300 years to get really down from 700 to 900, give or take, A.D. That's a lot of years after Christ, right? The Septuagint comes from about 200 years before Christ. And... Septuagint, you know, the 70, 70, trans, 70 translators translated in 70 days in the realm of the city of Alexandria, where they did that, a couple of hundred years before Christ, or right around the time that some of the Dead Sea Scrolls were starting to be put into the caves in Qumran. Not too many years ago, they found a fragment that had this passage on it from the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it supports, the Hebrew supports the translation in the Greek and not the Masoretic text. There you have it. Here's a case where the original text probably was uh, a little bit skewed uh, over time. Now Deuteronomy written somewhere around 1400, and now we're at 700 AD. That's a lot of years in between of copying. And that's what we think happened. Uh, so here the Septuagint probably is the original reading and now that part of the Septuagint becomes verbally inspired because it's in Hebrews. <laughs> so some of the Septuagint becomes verbally inspired because it's quoted in the New Testament. Kind of a crazy thing. Every once in a while, the Septuagint helps us understand the Hebrew. Uh, there's a lot of places where the Hebrew is a little corrupt, especially Samuel. Samuel is the most corrupted Old Testament book. I figure we only have about 60 or 65% of, of the original. Since we have other stuff and we know the stories from other places. What does seven mean? It means 70. So the 70 days for 70 translators to translate the Old Testament Hebrew into Greek. It's a Greek, the first Greek translation of the Bible that we're aware of anyhow. Yeah. You want to see one? I got one on my shelf. I think I have it there. Might be at home. Because I have it on my computer. So I double check this. It's kind of cool. I can go to a lot of research stuff uh, for these classes. Isn't that an interesting point, though? Now, so God preserves his word. Even when parts of it get a little screwed up over time, he makes sure we know what it is. And that makes sense here. So uh, the writer to the Hebrews is quoting the Septuagint, which is what he would have known anyways <coughs> from the Old Testament. I think that's kind of a big point. Let all the angels worship him. That would be in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, the Masoretic text is what you see there, translated into English. So the angels were to worship him. Well, if they're equal or bigger than Christ, why would they worship the Son? Right? They were created to worship him, to serve him. Um, one other point here. Um, 
is prototokon. That's the Greek word for firstborn. Now you have to understand that their concept was a little bit different than ours. Now you're the firstborn son. Are you the oldest or is your sister older than you? Oh, all my sisters are older than me. Okay, so, but he's still the firstborn son. Because in Israel, firstborn son carried with it some obligations of the parents, first of all, in redeeming the firstborn, because all the firstborn belonged to the Lord. Okay? The firstborn also was the one who normally would have the birthright, which means the double portion of the inheritance. So if you had two boys, uh, with the, the property would be divided three ways, and two portions would go to the oldest. So Joseph was considered the firstborn of Jacob because he was the oldest of his favorite wife, Rachel, even though there were five or six boys older than him, maybe more, I don't remember, oh, 10. I think he was number 11 in the lineup, Benjamin 12, right? But he got the double portion of the inheritance, didn't he? You had Ephraim and Manasseh, double portion, okay? Or Jacob and Esau, that's a crazy one because Esau sold his birthright, and then Rebekah helped Jacob steal it from Isaac, the actual promise. So the younger got the double portion by conniving. And yet it was still God's will because the promise was the older will serve the younger. But, you know, you have that all over. So uh, whether you had any other children, if you had a son, he was the firstborn. It doesn't mean there were other born children hmm. in, the, in, the, in the concept of the Hebrew. So the, the idea of Prototokos is that this is the firstborn and he is the only born. So now if you take that with, with uh, uh, John chapter 3, remember that, 3, verse 16? God loved the world so that he gave his one and only son. That's monogenes. That's the one of a kind genes born son. He's a one of a kind, but he's also the Prototokos. He's the firstborn of God begotten from the Father from eternity. It's part of that whole thinking there. This is not an easy thing to come with, but it, it just shows up in this particular text to show that the firstborn is greater than the angels. Everybody got that? This is the hardest passage in chapter 1. I told you Hebrews was not an easy book. <laughs> All right, can we go on to verse uh, 7, the fourth quote? Anybody? Got it, Liz? In speaking of the angels, he says, he makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire. Okay, there's that seraph. If you read the Hebrew, you see seraph there, uh, the seraphim. Servants is now the, an, an, uh, the uh, uh, emphasis of that. He makes the angels his servants and fiery ones. Uh, and they're spirits. They don't have bodies. Right? The angels are spirit beings. They don't have vertebrae and all that kind of stuff. Although they have appeared as humans sometimes. Uh, that's quoting Psalm 104, verse 4. He makes winds his messengers, flames of fire his servants. Comes right out of there. And again, the emphasis is on the fact that they're messengers. Uh, number 5, verses 8 and 9. Anybody? Scott? <laughs> But about the sun, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be a scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Ever God, your God, has set you above your com companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. Okay, there's a, a lot in here. This is Psalm 45, verses 6 and 7. And um, there's a lot in here. I mean, we have Christ's perfect life talked about, loved righteousness and hated wickedness, fulfilled in Christ's perfect life. Uh, the fact that he talks about it as having an eternal throne, olam ba olam, forever and ever. Uh, all the other kings died and were buried, but not this king. This king who sits on David's throne, obviously the writer to the Hebrews had, had that Second Samuel passage still in his mind as he's right, quoting this passage. And, of course, Christ is anointed to be the king of kings. And when was he anointed as king? And by whom? I think I have Acts 10.38 down there. <laughs> there it is. 
God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And it goes on to say at his baptism. So that's when he enters into his kingly office and his prophetic office and his priestly office, the start of his ministry, okay? He retains that as the Christ, the anointed one. That's what Christ means or Messiah means, okay? Kind of a neat passage there, right? I think so. Um, and then you see a passage from Corinthians. I wanted to add this because... Um, Paul writes in the very first chapter of 2 Corinthians, but as surely as God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no. We're not wishy-washy about our message. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among us by you, by me and Silas and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him it's always been yes. I think that's a powerful passage. Okay. <clears throat> For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. Those promises that were in the Old Testament, being quoted by Hebrew, the Hebrew author here now, is always yes in Christ. They're fulfilled in Christ. Need a cough drop? Got one. Yeah, I got one right here. She's got, take a dig. She's got a dig for it. Yeah, at the same time. Reminded me, my throat's getting dry. <laughs> Anyhow, okay. Number six. He also says, In the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment. They will be changed, but you remain the same, and your years will never end. That is a continuation about the addressing in verse 8. But about the Son, he says. So this is a continuation of that. Here's the Lord. He's the creator. One day he's going to roll it up like a garment and the new heavens and new earth be laid out. Okay? What a beautiful picture there for us. Um, he's quoting Psalm 102. So God sent to, set him above his companions... Uh, because he is the creator God. The angels are creatures. The Son is eternal. The angels are not. Well, they are in the sense that they will live forever because they're confirmed now, just like we will live forever too, right? Once our bodies rise from the dead, body and soul reunited, we'll live forever too. But not quite the same way as the one who was here before it started. Okay, that's the point. And number seven, the seventh quote, to which of the angels did God ever say, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? And the answer to that is, he never said that to anybody but his son. And that only after the victory was won. Uh, uh, Ephesians chapter one, the last half or so, actually the whole chapter, that will give you the support for this point where he's sitting on the right hand of God. And that's quoting Psalm 110 verse one, which is quoted a number of times in the New Testament. The Lord says to my Lord, sit on my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. All of this is addressed to, to the Son, who is also the King in this section. Now, in Hebrews, this whole idea of prophecy, fulfillment, that's the prophetic office of Christ. Here he talks a bit about his kingly office, but most of the rest of the letter to the Hebrews is going to be talking about uh, his, his uh, priestly office, because that was the one that was most directly involved with the issues that the people that um, uh, the letter was written to were dealing with, okay? And then the writer concludes, stating the biblical proofs from the Old Testament, are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Now Christ in his humility came to serve people, right? And not come to rule, but to serve. And he says, we're supposed to do the same thing, right? But once his service was over, he was elevated in the, in the ascension to the right hand of God, where he rules over all things, where the angels continued to, for all time, be ministering spirits. And that's how he concludes it here. What a wonderful chapter in the Bible, huh? Now, we could have gone on for a couple more hours with the points here, but I hope I, I was able to clearly... Uh, share with you what what the uh, author is trying to get across to these 
Jewish believers who are under, un, under the stress of, should we go back to Judaism or stay faithful to Christ? Well, it doesn't pay to go back to Judaism because Christ is the Lord. And you can talk about angels all you want, but Christ is superior. Okay, that's kind of what it is. Comments or thoughts here before we close with prayer. <clears throat> Okay, let's close with prayer then. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy word, which you show is, be, is fulfilled in Christ. That the Old Testament promises, uh, your promises were fulfilled by your son, who carried our burdens and endured our, our punishment, who died for the sins of the world, but whom you raised to life again and sat at the right hand of your power and majesty. Lord, keep us faithful to him. And help us to be the messengers you want us to be, in that case, uh, angels, uh, to bring the good news, the good angel, the good message to our world. We pray this in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen.